Don't forget to make me a host. Oh yeah. Good, good <laughs> reminder. I got you. Good reminder. <laughs> um, we're going to wait a couple minutes here just for a few more to come in and then we will get started. Um, if you want to show your face today, that is completely fine. This video is mm. being recorded and uh, will be repurposed. And yeah, happy to have you here at the Chicago Blockchain Real Estate Collective Meetup. This is our second meetup now having conversations focused on real estate and blockchain and the direction that blockchain is going to be taking this industry moving forward. There's, there's really no more maybe. It, it is the direction in which not only real estate, but really all major industries are headed right now. And we're just happy to be here at the forefront as uh, new beginnings happen again with blockchain and real estate here in the US. This meetup was put together uh, by myself and most importantly, Michael Flight, the, the leader, the manager of this group on uh, meetup.com. Just want to give a quick moment for Michael of uh, Liberty Real Estate Fund to say hello to our attendees and share any other um, thoughts that he might have about today's meetup. And Michael, you're on, you're on mute right now. Thank you very much for everybody showing up. Uh, appreciate you coming today. I'll uh, keep it short. We're very excited. Uh, we're trying to uh, put together content uh, once every two weeks or once every three weeks. So, and uh, we're honored to have Daniela uh, speaking today. And also, um, Sam Halawi, who is uh, with me and Adam in the Liberty Real Estate Fund is gonna give a little bit of an update because uh, he attended a conference uh, called Consensus uh, Network. And so he's got a little bit more insight into some of the things that are happening in uh, blockchain security tokens and uh, securitizing assets on the blockchain. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And guys, everyone, our, our headline speaker, our main speaker today, as Michael just emphasizes, Daniela Gertovich. Uh, she's going to be talking about designing for a blockchain future in free societies. But before we get to Daniela, also, as Michael just mentioned, we have, um, I guess to say, my partner and also fellow member of the Next Level Mastermind here, Sam Halawi. Uh, and also, I should say, most importantly, he's a part of the Liberty Real Estate Fund, which is what we're really excited to talk about here. Um, Sam was just at Consensus Conference, which is probably the leading blockchain and cryptocurrency conference that, uh, that's out there right now. And he was able to get a lot of information, key takeaways from the conference. So Sam, you and I, were just going to go back and forth here a little bit about your experience during that conference and share uh, with our attendees today a little bit about what you learned and what we can look forward to with real estate and blockchain moving forward. Sounds great. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, appreciate your time. And so I guess tell us just, you know, high level stuff to begin with, two or three takeaways that really stood out to you in regards to what we can start focusing on uh, in regards to real estate and blockchain. Yeah, sure thing. So first, um, Consensus is one of the biggest uh, blockchain and crypto conferences out there uh, this year. Um, you know, the same group. So it's, it's held by uh, Coindesk. They're the ones that put on the conference. And this year, about 22,000 attendees joined and uh, thought leaders from around the world, um, you know, they shared their vision for crypto and, and the blockchain space from, you know, the former uh, CFTC commissioner, uh, some senators, members of the um, executive board of the uh, European Central Bank, and, um, you know, even um, some, some people in the entertainment industry, um, the chain smokers were, were even um, speaking about their invest. Uh, you know, the, their whole investment philosophy and what they're looking for in the space. Um, so a, a couple of things that I really, that really stood out to me first was, um, you know, mass adoption, travel rule, and the European central bank using blockchain and just different central banks um, starting to really take a, a closer look at blockchain and um, what they're going to do with, um, you know, developing their own digital currencies. And uh, right now also, I think we got some great insight from the SEC um, you know, they're talking a little bit more about the type of regulations they're looking at and the U.S. adoption uh, beginning to move forward. So there's more security being put in, in place and it makes the market more comfortable with being able to um, innovate in the blockchain space and really benefit from the ecosystem. So we're starting to get some more uh, guidance on, on what we can and can't do in this space. And I think that's really going to drive mass adoption and innovation. 
It's interesting how you mentioned there too, uh, the celebrities that were there and as you said, the chain smokers. And I know Daniela and I were just a part of a conference this past weekend, which kind of ties into the topic of her presenta presentation today. Um, uh, Akon, the famous singer Akon was getting ready to uh, do some kind of blockchain project in Senegal. So it's really interesting to see how celebrities are getting in on it. Um, do you see that? This is just a question for me to you, Sam. Do you think uh, central banks getting involved is something to be cautious of for the technology moving forward? Or do you see it more as um, a beacon of hope? No, I definitely see it as a beacon of hope. And, um, you know, sometimes uh, the governments and, and just central authority, they don't really like to innovate. They just like to keep on doing what, what really works. And, um, you know, and at some point, you know, it's either innovate and uh, disrupt or be disrupted, right? And uh, I think they're seeing that, especially with Libra and um, even Acoin, you know, that's, that's huge, um, especially right now with Libra coming out. I mean, Facebook has more than 2 billion users that they can onboard and, uh, you know, get, get in the system. So it's, it's huge. And um, I think, and, and even, you know, regulators in the U.S. and abroad said the only, the, you know, the main reason that they started taking the closer look at it and taking it more seriously is because of Libra and, um, you know, the, the Chinese um, central bank taking, um, you know, stab at it as well. Absolutely. And we have some a little bit more time here before we're going to flip it over to Daniela. So I do <coughs> just briefly want to talk on it because it was a very hot topic in our last meetup. Uh, the Liberty Real Estate Fund is something that I know myself, Michael, Sam, we're all pretty excited about. Do you think there's any takeaways from Consensus Conference that we're going to be able to use for what we're working on uh, moving forward? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in terms of, I think one of the biggest takeaways is there's definitely an appetite for what we're doing. Um, investors are looking to um, really invest in security tokens rather than ICOs that aren't really, you know, um, you know, utility tokens aren't really backed by anything. Crypto tokens, you know, cryptocurrency, that's really not backed by anything except for what the next person's, you know, willing to pay for it. So um, a lot of people are interested in this space. I see a ton of innovation, whether it's uh, KYC, AML, um, you know, regulators starting to talk about it. And a lot of uh, security exchanges, security token exchanges are starting to come online. And, and, um, and, and really a lot of institutional players as well because they're the ones that are going to be providing a lot of the liquidity piece um in the whole equation so, so that's that's a very important um topic right there and and now they're they're starting to talk more about it and they're building more products uh, to to really meet the institutional investors needs and that's going to drive mass adoption as well so it's All exciting right. yeah, exciting space Exc exciting time for the space definitely and i'd say outside of attending this meetup to get that cutting edge insight. Is there any place you can refer our attendees and listeners to t today to get more information about either what took place at Consensus or really just where you're getting a lot of your information as well? Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll throw some links in, in the chat, but um, Coindesk is a great resource. Um, STO Market, um, their Twitter handle is, is a great, uh, the tw you know, Twitter profile is a great uh, account to follow. And then also, uh, the block and, um, and one more I'm, I'm blanking on right now. Oh, D decrypt, excuse me. Um, and I'll throw the, the links for, uh, the consensus as well. They recorded a lot of the, um, the meetings. Um, so I would, I would definitely take a look at those. Perfect. There we go. And I see uh, Zach Racinger just posted in there. Thank you, Zach. Um, also want to encourage everyone right now, the chat box is wide open throughout this uh, presentation today. So if you have any questions for Daniela along the way, please put them in there. We'll make sure that we get to them because she is going to do a Q&A for roughly the, the final 10 to 15 minutes of, of her time. Um, if you have any questions or follow-up questions for Sam too, Sam, I would say if you just want to put your email address in the chat box as well. Um, you know, guys, we view this Meetup. I'm sure there's other people around the world doing it, but again, based, based on our focus and our industry, not a whole lot of individuals are, and we really view this as, uh, you know, the, the edge, the advantage. If you're here with us today and you stick with us, you're going to be very well positioned moving forward into the future of blockchain and real estate. So with that, Sam, thank you for your time. I'm sorry, I, I didn't ask if you had any closing remarks there. <laughs>
No, I, I, I just wanted to say, you know, once again, uh, you know, it's, it's really, it's an exciting time to be in the space and uh, we're still in the early adoption phase. I'm, I'm you know, fairly certain on, about that. And, um, you know, right now is the time to build while other people are still, you know, speculating on the sidelines. And then once it's time for mass adoption, you know, we're going to, we're going to be the, um, you know, the, the experts in the field. So thank you all for your time as well. Appreciate it. Thank you, Sam. One more reminder, guys. Remember, as Danielle is presenting, if you have any, have any questions, thoughts, ideas along the way, please put them in the chat box. I know Sam's going to be in there as well. So if you guys have questions for him, go for it. Um, so here we go. Daniela Gertovic. I almost called her Gertovici, but she corrected me. She's Romanian, so she can tell you a little bit about how that pronunciation works out. But it's Daniela Gertovic. What a resume this woman has. Uh, here we go. Daniela is an architect, researcher, educator, and scholar with over 25 years of international experience as an architectural designer technology, and technologist in complex mixed-use urban developments, such as Burj Khalifa in Dubai and Shanghai North Bund White Magnolia Plaza. She has been teaching for over 10 years, most recently as a full-time graduate faculty and thesis chair at Harrington College of Design. She's the curator and sponsor of ARC Agenda Debates at the Chicago Architectural Biennial, the lead strategist and curator of Lieberland Design Competitions 2015 and 2020, something um, I just got to throw a little marketing plug out there, follow up with her on the Lieberland Design Competitions. If she doesn't talk about them today, because that's a cool project, Michael and Sam know about that one. Um, she's the co-curator of Free Private Cities Design Symposium. Daniela holds a Bachelor of Fine Arts Diploma from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, a Master of Architecture Diploma from the University of Illinois at Chicago, and is currently a PhD candidate in Computational mm. Architectural Theory at the European Graduate School in Switzerland under the supervision of a very remarkable individual, Patrick Schumacher. If you guys, I mean, Daniela's bio just goes on and on and on with really impressive things that she's done and is doing. If you want more information on Daniela, her full bio is in the event description. I highly encourage you to go check it out because um, she's going to talk about some more of this stuff that I'm fast forwarding through so we can just get through to her. So Daniela, the microphone is yours. Welcome to the Chicago Real Estate Blockchain Collective. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the lovely introduction. And thank you, Adam and Michael, for inviting me. Uh, I'm going to jump right into my presentation. I'm going to switch to slides because I'm afraid that I'm going to run out of time. So if you give me one moment. Do you guys see my screen? You are good to go. Okay, so... Um, my name is Daniela Gerdovich, and I'm, uh, it's a real pleasure and honor to be here. And I initially joined this meetup um, just to learn from you guys and never expected to talk on week two. Um, so it's really an honor to be here. And uh, I was given this topic, Designing for a Blockchain Future in Free Societies, which is rather perfect for me. Um, and as Adam said, I am the director of Arc Agenda LLC, which is a company that I started in 2015, right when Lieberland was getting on the ground. And I'm not going to go through my whole bio again, but I am going to say that my company is a research-based architectural and computational design lab, which aims to advance and promote new agenda of radical innovation for the 21st century in architecture and design known as parametricism, which is a style of architecture, contemporary avant-garde style of architecture. Arc Agenda is also a Chicago Biennial Affiliate Program Partner. So the thesis of this talk is that radical new agendas emerge in times of crisis and in cycles of disruptive innovation. And I'm going to start with times of crisis. Since we are in a time of crisis, and those have been defining moments throughout my architectural career, which started in 1995, these, these turnarounds that happen at crisis points. So around the year 2000, about five years into my career, I was actually working for, as a real estate developer, I was working for a large retail real estate developer. 
and we were working on a huge project for Toronto, putting in a bid to renovate Toronto Union Station and to overbuild it with 5 million square feet of new real estate mixed use. And boom, 9-11 happened. So what we were working on at the time was um, this, I'll just show you a few slides of that project. We were working in a consortium. My company was LNH Real Estate Group. Um, and then we were working with the Office for Metropolitan Architecture, uh, Rem Koolhaas and Dan Wood, Bayer Blinder Bell and Q2 out of Toronto. And just to give you an idea of the context, you see the little blue development at the bottom that was our um, that was our development right on the lake, and it had a large component which was transit, um, and then large mixed use. After that occurred, a few years later, I transitioned into a global architecture practice at Skidmore Owings and Merrill LLC, and I worked there for a while. And um, in 2008, boom, the market crashed. That was another really defining moment in my career. And what I was working on at SOM, um, SOM, uh, by the way, does these huge developments in master planning, um, which are essentially uh, like developing private cities in the sense that the developers uh, actually set the bar for planning and zoning and design in those areas. So um, it's not like the normal process where you go through zoning variants and, and all kinds of governmental procedures in order to be able to build what you want. With these larger developments, especially in the foreign countries where I was working, they really set the bar for the area. So some of those developments were like Burj Khalifa, which is the world's tallest building. I actually worked on this for about four years. I was on the design team and then I was on the uh, technical team as well. And you just see some views of it. I'm sure you've seen it before. Um, but this development really set the bar for Dubai. It actually, they actually took the, um, the codes and zoning ordinances and things that we developed for this project and utilized it for all of Dubai. So it set the standard for Dubai. Um, this was um, Shanghai's White Magnolia Plaza. This, these were actually the competition renderings. The actual built um, project is a little bit different than this, but about approximately the same size. And you can see that was also a very complex mixed use project. And then in 2006, I was working on um, the world's first net zero energy super tall tower. Um, and that was um, Pearl River in Guangzhou, China. And you see some visuals for it. And we also participated in the show um, curated by Bruce Mao in Chicago at the Museum of Contemporary Art called Massive Change. And that show in particular had a really big influence on the community in Chicago as far as sustainable design. So it kind of kickstarted the sustainable design movement very widely. Uh, among architects and designers. So fast forward in 2019, the global markets are booming and boom, coronavirus hits. And what I decided to do during this, because I see moments of crisis as opportunities to advance some radical innovations, um, is I decided to rerun the 2015 Liberland Design Competition with, with some additional twists. And we presented that at the Liberland Architecture Conference at length. So if you're interested in, in the competition, you can hear a whole lecture about it that I did along with some very wonderful talks. Um, and I'm gonna just introduce you very quickly to what the Liberland competition is. So the premise is that we are in this unprecedented, unprecedented moment of global crisis and that we have the opportunity to collectively rethink the value agendas, practices guiding uh, the design of our built environments. So as countries converge on these drastic social control measures that aim to combat the coronavirus, essentially the fundamental infrastructures of every societal function system have been undermined and threatened with collapse or at best an unstable future. 
So there is this newfound urgency to activate novel agendas to counteract this new normal. And my feeling is that Libra land is, has the agenda that's ideal um, to challenge what's going on right now. So Libra land is the first, is the world's newest micronation established in 2015. It is an incubator and role model for a society founded on the ideology of liberty and principles of anarcho-capitalism. Uh, it is founded on the idea that the societal movement towards individual and collaborative freedom or collective freedom, prosperity, and peace will not emerge through bigger governments, but rather through distributed intelligence of autonomous innovators and agents of change. So at the moment, Liberland is a country, a city, a network of communications, a futuristic society, a utopian vision, but it is also a globally distributed network of intelligences and a database of societal visions that can counteract the global chaos that's unfolding in the wake of the pandemic. Liberland's motto is to live and let live, and it is expressed in its aspiration towards individual and collective freedom, autonomy, minimal governance, volunteerism, charity, free fair markets, non-aggression, non-coercion, diplomatic goodwill, radical innovation, entrepreneurship, and ecological responsibility, all supported by a distributed and transparent peer-to-peer -peer network blockchain. Um, so excuse me, I'm sorry. So one thing I want to mention before I move on, I'm not sure what happened to that slide. Oh, here it is. Okay, so can Liberland's radical new possibilities for liberty, an unleashed free market economy, and a transparent distributed peer-to-peer -peer computational network stimulate a radical transformation in the built environment? That's essentially the thesis of the competition. And what I'm ch challenging people to do is to look very deeply as architects and designers into the theories and practicalities of blockchain and to actually materially translate those into architectural proposals. Um, this has not really been done before. There are many peer-to-peer -peer computational networks in architecture, but none of them are truly blockchain applied to new designs. So I'm uh, really looking forward to seeing what people will submit to this competition. So just briefly, Liberland is on a piece of disputed territory between Croatia and Serbia. Um, and you can see um, this competition is actually including both Liberland, which is 700 hectares, seven square kilometers, and uh, Napredak. Um, now Napredak is Liberland's gateway for their um, trips by boat. And Napredak is going to be developed very soon, um, whereas Liberland is a longer range proposition. So you can see Liberland is right on the Danube River, and one of the challenges is that it, it floods. I'm sorry, can I ask you guys to turn off your microphones real quick? Um, and as you can see, um, this is the territory. It's just gorgeous forested territory whereas Napredak is an industrial site, a former industrial site, and this is what it looks like. It's just waiting for construction. Um, if you're interested in finding out more about the competition, you can go to designlibreland2020.splashthat.com, and I can put that in the chat box afterwards. Um, and uh, as Adam mentioned, I, I am co-curating a uh, symposium, a virtual symposium on July 18th called Free Private Cities. And um, that emerged as part of this Liberland competition because Liberland competition is bringing up so many issues that are far reaching into architecture and have a much broader um, sort of discourse in the profession. So we are going to invite outside speakers um, and it's going to be co-hosted um, by Liberland and ourselves, the curators. And some of the topics are going to be free private cities, uh, the digital transformation in architecture, uh, epigenetic complex systems, um, complex engineering systems such as dig digital fabrication and robotics. But details about that are going to come up pretty soon.
So what are the lessons from private cities? Why private cities? Because we're in an unprecedented moment of planning challenges all over the world. Um, and change through governments comes notoriously dif is notoriously difficult. Um, private cities provide a solution to a planning deadlock um, and liberalize our cities. And essentially, um, the big idea behind private cities is that you sell off large parcels of land to private developers and that those developers in turn build all the amenities, including roads, utilities, etc. Um, and then they lease and sell the property to others. And they obviously they they also build um, their development. So private cities seem radical at first. Um, but from the developing world, from India and Honduras, private cities provide real relief from corrupt and inefficient governments. And um, I'm going to refer to Titus Gable, um, who is a big proponent of free private cities. He actually has the website called Free Private Cities and writes about it very extensively and is very involved in Libra land as well. And he outlines 10 points about private cities that I'm gonna go through very quickly. So a private, private city is sovereign or semi-autonomous and it has its own regulatory framework, its own taxation, customs, social regime, as well as its own administration, security forces, et cetera. A free private city is run by an operating company that is a for-profit business. Um, and um, participation in residence is voluntary. Um, there are no legal claims to admission, so it's not like uh, a citizenship in a country. And each individual residence um, concludes a citizen's contract. So basically you have a contract with the governing or the, I should say this private company, this for-profit company, and the advantage to that is that this contract cannot be uni unilaterally changed by, say, elections. So you don't have this election where every time you get some new elected official, the rules change. You basically are a contract citizen in this scenario. And contract citizens are um, free to do as they please, provided that they do not violate the rights of others. And um, all the rules are laid down in this contract, so it's a negotiation. It's not a given set of rules as you would get in developing uh, in a city. Um, so the contractors are responsible for the consequences of their actions, not the society or the city operator. And a resident can determine the contract, uh, can terminate the contract at any time and leave the city. And in the event of conflicts with the operating company, each party is entitled to appeals to, um, to appeal to independent arbitration courts um, that are not part of the operated organization. So that's a, a much more fair distribution of power um, than what we currently have in our current system. And I want to point out a study that Patrick Schumacher, who had him, um, Adam talked about briefly. Um, he actually happens to be my PhD supervisor and he is the, the principal of Zaha Hadid Architects, which is the most innovative firm in the world, in my opinion. And um, what he says about private cities is that the critical issue is how much pres prescriptive planning, if any, would not only be compatible with libertarian ideological credentials of a place like Liberland, but more importantly, how much planning and of what kind of any would be optimally prosperity enhancing for Liberland. So he was writing this specifically about Liberland, but he actually titled it libertarian urban planning. And it's something that he's been thinking about for a while. And also by default, I have been thinking about as his student. Um, so he proposes three orders. I'm not going to go through this in detail because we're pressed for time, but I really recommend this reading, um, his article about this. He actually talks about different regulatory or planning regimes for urban development, um, from uh, ranging from a sponsored order 
um, which is pretty much similar to master planning through self-governed order, through spontaneous order, which is basically open and free for all. Um, and again, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but I really recommend this reading. And I want to go briefly through some of the proposals that we got for the 2015 competition, just so you can see the huge range of the types of things that people were thinking about. So here's an algae powered sustainable micronation of innovators proposal. Um, here's a proposal for a, a very minimum footprint um, type high density um, uh, development. Um, here's a super sustainable uh, and fantastical type of development. And then we have things that look more like cities that we're used to and very high density cities and the whole range in between. So one more thing I wanted to point to, uh, another thing um, that Patrick Schumacher has been developing and that I've been um, studying up on is having to do with housing specifically in, in markets. So in our current system, um, developers and architects are super constrained by planners and regulations. And it's somewhat politically rigged because land use allocation, density and unit mix are determined by bureaucrats. And the question is, what is left for the developer and also by default the architect to do? Planners tend to have arbitrary powers over developers. They dictate population mix in a building, so they do social engineering. They provide layout diagrams, dictate daylight, ceiling heights, privacy equipment. Um, and in doing so, they are basically doing the architect's work too. And the outcome of all this is that there is no rhyme and reason to the planning outcomes, because if you look at our big cities, they are ultimately a big hodgepodge of all, all kinds of developments and mixtures of developments. Um, so there isn't something like an urban curation of identities. Um, so the, what Patrick proposes is to counteract this with free cities where the market discovers what is wanted instead of planners predictating and ordinances predictating what is designed. Um, so there are choices to be discovered through entrepreneurship and doing market testing and seeing what works and what people want. Um, so he's proposing to scrap zoning restrictions, to scrap minimum space standards, to scrap unit mixes, um, and to allow entrepreneurial flourishing and startup incubators combined with, um, with uh, the residents to discover what is is going to work. And with that, he has been involved in something called Prospera, which has just been inaugurated a few days ago. And this is in Honduras, and it's a special economic, similar to a special economic zone. Um, and what he says about it is that it's a radically innovative venture in city and society creation based on unusual degrees of individual and entrepreneurial freedom. And these are some of the residences that he, his company has proposed, um, and you can visit that site. So getting back to the thesis, I wanna now go into cycles of disruptive innovation. Um, so broadly, um, my research interests and research agendas, which are in the area of disruptive innovations. So my, Incidentally, my PhD is in computational and architectural theory, or computational design theory. Um, and so I've been studying mass media for a long time. And th this is just sort of um, a, a laundry list of agendas that I'm interested in. So post Ford Network Society, parametricism, which the tw is the 21st century computationally empowered style of architecture mass media theory, um, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, augmented reality, internet of things, distributed intelligence and open source systems, distributed peer-to-peer -peer computational networks such as blockchain, free private cities, virtual cities, and liquid democracy. So those are my personal research interests. And I want to talk a little bit about mass media because I think we're in this moment where 
And this is very key and blockchain really fits into this. So most often when people are asked to describe the current media landscape, they respond by making an inventory of tools and technologies. Our focus should not be on emerging technologies, but on emerging cultural practices. Rather than listing tools, we need to understand the underlying logic shaping our current moment of media and transition. These properties cut across different media platforms and different cultural communities. They suggest something of the way that we live in relation to media today. So there are seven uh, defined mass medias, and you can see the years they are print, recording, cinema, radio, television, internet, and uh, most recently mobile phones. But what I want to propose is that blockchain is the eighth mass media. And um, this is a quote from Melanie Swan, um, who is the founder of the Institute for Blockchain Studies. And she says, we should think about blockchain as another class of thing like the internet, a comprehensive information technology with tiered technical levels and multiple classes of applications for any form of asset registry, inventory and exchange, including every area of finance, economics and money, hard assets such as physical property, and intangible assets such as votes, ideas, reputation, intention, health data, information, etc. And to this, I really want to add architecture. And that is my aim within writing the brief for Liberland um, design competition. So just to group these mass medias a little bit, just to give some perspective on it. So the broadcast medias, radio, TV, and cinema, the older mediums um, were centralized. And then we also have interactive network media such as telephones, emails, faxes, and the internet. All those are centralized. And what I'm proposing is that um, the reason I want to add blockchain to, to the types of media is because I think it's a different animal entirely because it is decentralized. Mobile phones are not unlike that. They also have the characteristics of being decentralized. And in general, distributed peer-to-peer -peer computational networks have been very prevalent in architecture. Um, they haven't been blockchain, but they have been open source types of distributions. And there are laws that govern um, the reach of each one of these mediums or the effectiveness of each medium. And I'm going to go over these laws. They are Sarnoff's, Metcalf's, and Reed's law. And Sarnoff's law pertains um, to a one-to-one -one type of medium such as TV, radio, and cinema, so the broadcast mass media. Metcalf's law uh, pertains to one-to-one -one in the network of many. So for instance, think of a telephone, email, or fax. And finally, Reed's law is for a network of many such as social networks, internet groups, and ultimately blockchain. But in reality, these laws are not separate. It's, uh, it's kind of a conglomeration on the internet and networks are much mess messier, more asymmetric and chaotic than those laws. Daniela. However, yeah. Hey, um, I know because you, you asked me to hop in in case, because this is your first time doing this presentation. So I just want to make sure, uh, how much more time do we have? Because we do want to be, we're, uh, we're getting close to the end here. I want to extend the meetup just a little bit for Q&A. Um, uh, I roughly. think I'm, I have about five to ten more minutes. I'll go very fast. Okay. Okay. So these laws, I won't go over them again. What I want to do is um, I want to actually hop on here and show you a quick animation. This was a result of, um, this was a company that I had a while ago when I was an academic called Playas Design and we did a lot of design research and computation. So this kind of illustrates the, the one-to-many media, which is something like TV. And you'll see in a minute that the reach in a group of 100 people is basically 100. So when, um, when all is said and done, if you have a group of 100 people and you're trying to reach them through something like me, uh, the media of television or radio or cinema, um, you, you've gathered a group of 100, and that's the equation. But what you're going to see next 
is um, under Metcalf's law is the one-to-one -one in a network of many. So for instance, if you have email and you have a group of 100 people, there are actually 4,950 possible connections within that. So it grows exponentially, but it's not the internet yet. It's not something like social media yet. I'll just let this run for a minute. So you can see um, the calculation that's used under Metcalf's law to figure out reach. Um, but then when you have a distributed network media, such as um, social networks or blockchain, suddenly you have this extraordinary exponential number, which I cannot even pronounce. Um, it's in the billions and billions. So the point I'm trying to make is that we, we have had um, a very, very radical change in mass media. Um, and one thing that's speculated is that post the pandemic, we're gonna make a big migration to cyberspace. So this media reach is gonna be huge. It's gonna be a huge um, factor to consider and especially if we're migrating to blockchain. So virtual reality in architecture uh, is relatively new, although research has been going on towards it for a very long time. And I wanna specifically talk about architecture and cyberspace as kind of my thesis of what design is becoming in the future and in the present actually. So um, virtual reality systems are pretty staggering. Um, there are platforms for virtual reality already, but the idea that we'll someday socialize, shop, play, and even work inside digital environments is becoming far more um, recognizable as a development of our modern era, and specifically through gaming, and I'm gonna go through this quicker. So gaming in China, for instance, has um, uh, grown astronomically, um, and there are virtual markets. For instance, there is a Japanese expo market called VCAT on VR chat platform, and um, what it basically is is an expo that spans 36 different quote unquote worlds contained within the uh, VRC chat ecosystem. And it's a kind of a modern second day, uh, second life where you create an avatar and you can, you can have transactions um, that are real. Um, but what I wanna talk about is um, Liberland when it celebrated its fifth anniversary introduced uh, its virtual reality platform um, which looks like this and uh, actually Liberland has established a virtual reality embassy in uh, Somnium space which is a virtual reality platform. Um, so it's basically um, where representatives can meet and um, be part of the free decentralized world. Um, and the immersiveness of uh, virtual reality is um, coupled up with blockchain on this platform. So it's actually a virtual reality platform powered by blockchain. So all the land avatars, buildings, et cetera, are owned via blockchain tokens. And unlike other game platforms, it does not own your data or account, and it is truly a free decentralized market. Um, companies are established in some name space, and people are making a living in some name space, and Liberland is looking at developing um, a market within some name space specifically for architecture, where architects can uh, upload their models and actually sell them and later on build them on real territory. And obviously all the, I'm, I don't have to go through this, but all the stability of blockchain uh, will really contribute to virtual architecture. Um, if you're interested in finding out more about what's going on in architecture relative to virtual reality, both in designing and presenting to clients, you can look at Urban Hub. And um, they basically, um, are an interactive platform for people working on future of cities and mobility 
and it's a collection of future ideas about sustainable development of cities worldwide. And with that, I'm going to conclude. Thank you very much, Daniela, for the, the detailed presentation. I know we had a lot of uh, comments come through there. So we're going to do our best to address a couple of them now. Technically, the meetup uh, is over right now. So if you guys do have to get going, we completely understand. Daniela's contact information is in the chat box if you do want to reach out to her, especially if we don't get to maybe some questions here today. But I will say, um, you know what, we'll address one right here out of the gate. And then if anyone else um, has another question, I'd say just go ahead and type it in now so that way it pops up right at the chat, uh, the chat box and then we'll wrap things up here today. So um, I wanna give an opportunity to the per first person really. Michael, I'm gonna skip you. You asked a good question. If we have to go to it, we will, but I saw Marlene come through. Um, and actually, hold on Marlene. No, this is like a, I just realized. What choice will they have? Some will be able to, okay, sorry Marlene. Oh, oh, here we go. Mar I, I was gotcha. just responding to someone else's question. Okay, well, thank you for speaking up. <laughs> that helps. Um, here we go then. All right. Daniela, the idea of personal of a personal constitution is so interesting. I will check out Titus Gabel. I'm also wondering if it exists or if it's only theoretical. It exists to various degrees. So there are... Um, especially if you look at Paul Romer's theories on um, cities, you're going to find that there have been various experiments in various jurisdictions with constitutions that have given more freedom and have been managed by private entities. But um, free, a true free private city that is not a charter city per se, but a true private city um, I would say Liberland is really the first of its kind, the one that aspires to the most freedom and to, to the most um, types of things that Titus Gable talks about. So it's not theoretical in the sense that Liberland exists. It actually has had 600,000 applicants for citizenship. Um, the country can only hold 120,000 residents, so they do have an e-residency program where you can set up virtual businesses in Lieberland. Um, so it, it is actual, it's happening, uh, but it is not built yet. Yep, that's a great recap of Lieberland, how I'd put it. And I'd also say if you have any uh, further questions on Lieberland, definitely reach out to Daniela or myself. I actually host the Lieberland show, the podcast. Um, Michael Flight is pretty well plugged in there as well. Um, like I had a, a nice statement here, I'm currently looking to the construction of assisted living facilities using modular construction so the homes can be integrated with uh, Internet of Things. Any insight on this would be super helpful also to expedite the process of construction itself. And it looks like Sam had some interest in that as well. So any thoughts on that, Daniela? Well, my big thought about modular construction has to do with the technologies that are on the ground right now in terms of robotics and 3D printing specifically. Um, I'm not a huge researcher into the Internet of Things. It is one of my interests, but I'm, I have dabbled in it more than studied it very thoroughly. Um, so I don't really have a comment about that. But when it comes to modular housing, it's really worth looking into robotic fabrication, specifically stuff that's going on in China on a very large scale where they've actually like 3D printed whole houses. Uh, and like uh, airlifted them into place. It's, it's a very interesting um, area to look into. All right, and we have a question from Mo, Daniela. Uh, Mo, it looks like, are you gonna unmute for us? Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, um, Daniela, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the, cause you mentioned about social engineering. You know, um, how will Lieberlin be set up in a way where, um, you know, the powers that be are not utilizing that to change people's viewpoints and their mindset. And people are allowed to really think freely and to act freely within the construct of how liberal is being constructed or set up. But how do you protect people that are in power from constantly wanting to naturally or innately want to take more and more and control people from a social engineering standpoint? Yeah, so the social engineering point I was trying to make 
uh, pertains to the types of planning that goes on right now and the social engineering that's done on a planning and zoning level to where um, developers cannot break free of that, but to answer more specifically what you're asking. So Liberland is actually transitioning to full blockchain governance. So they're going to have some services that are not that are also on the ground, but it's it's basically going to transfer into a fully transparent, distributed peer-to-peer -peer governance, um, which doesn't exist in the world right now. But that is what they are aspiring to do. Um, and so, in in my opinion, that would offer maximum protection for individual freedom and rights because basically. Voting is going to be distributed, services are going to be distributed on blockchain, everything is going to be transparent and available to everyone um, and, and made a lot more secure and fair. So I don't know if I've answered that. I'm just sort of trying to do a shorthand. Uh, no, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Daniela, one more time. Thank you, Mo, for that question. It was a great one. Um, Liberland's a very interesting project. I know that wasn't necessarily the focus of our conversation today, but it looks like that's where it ended up. And I have to say, um, anyone out there, if you are interested in learning more about the topics of today's discussion, please reach out to Daniela, Sam, I should say myself as well. I'm going to go ahead and put my email here in the chat box if you guys want to follow up with me. Um, Michael Flight, our co-host, had to hop off a little bit early. But we will be back next month um, at a date to be determined, likely three Thursdays from now. So actually, in a way, I guess it is predetermined. June 18th is what we're looking at for our next presentation or next meetup, I should say. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us here today. Daniela, I just want to give you one more moment to uh, give any closing remarks. Well, well, thank you again for inviting me, and I really look forward to learning from you guys. That's why I joined this meetup. Um, so looking forward to future um, presentations. Absolutely. Thank you. And as, as I mentioned, thank you again, Sam, too. Are you still with us? Yeah, I am. Uh, All right. My pleasure. And thanks, everyone, for your time. Looking forward to learning more uh, from you guys and seeing how we can add more value um, thanks again for your time. Stay safe out there. Look forward to our next meetup. All right. Thank you everyone for attending the Chicago Blockchain Real Estate Collective meetup for May. We'll see you in June. Thanks.